So I'm our players. If you look at the uh, the Princeton screen, this is J A Bay. You will see one of the co one of the lead first authors. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know Alex. Little more, yeah. I think that's it. And you can sit in the this one or that one. Back one. Yeah. And then that's Nicholas Turner. Hello. Oh, Shanti. Oh, he's here. If you saw the voice video, Nick is the voice. Nick is the person behind the voice in there. <laughs> the person behind the voice. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Sean. Hey, here. And we've got Sean Mu, uh, sort of behind Alex's head. There we go. Also, one of the, so we've got three, <laughs> four first authors of this paper. The other one being Vinza, who is still in Korea. Oh, yeah. Say hi. <laughs> Who's in Korea right now. And they have very kindly, and Celia's here as well. Uh, these guys have very kindly put together a presentation that's a, an overview of the new cell paper that just came out. Um, and then I think we would just do questions and answers and help you guys uh, answer, answer any questions that you guys have about the paper that recently came out or about iWire or neuroscience in general. And if we don't instantly have an answer, we will look one up. We will reach out to other researchers and get an answer for you. Um, so maybe a good way to start would be with intros for the iWires who are currently popping in here. TR77, do you have a mic? I do. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, nice to see you all. Hi, nice to see you too. Where are you coming in from? I am coming in from the southern United States. Oh, cool. I'm from the southern United States in Alabama, so. Oh, cool. <laughs> Nice to hear a, a good southern accent. Yeah. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you. And your username is TR77. Yes, correct. Yeah. <laughs> That's an easy one. We got M. Does Marissa have a mic on her computer? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. M is M. Okay, she's chatting saying no. Uh, that's M in the Game Master office chiming in. Uh, Atani, not that you need an introduction, but you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Oh, I don't know that I really need to introduce myself, but hi, everybody. I'm also coming in from the southern U.S., Arkansas more specifically. Um, TR77, I really like your uh, picture there in front of the dinosaur. Hey, thanks very much. Cool. That's a cool dinosaur. All right, and we've also got Kevin Boyd. Hello. Hi. Hey. Where are you coming in from? Do you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Oh, good. Great. Good. Uh, Houston, Texas. I am the dragon turtle. Dragon turtle. Nice to hear you. Cool. And then we have Ryan. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. 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 All right. I'm coming in from just outside of Boston. I live in Arlington. Oh, cool. So Local to you guys, I think, or some of you guys. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's pretty close. Yeah, that's really close. <laughs> yeah, we're in Boston. <laughs> cool. And then lastly, we have these guys from Princeton. And I'll pass it off to you guys. Right. Uh, hi, my name is Alex, and I'm one of the cool first authors on this paper. And I'm here. Also on the <laughs> I'm Nick, also on the paper. Um, I'm a fourth year grad student in computer science. Yeah, so how should we do this, Amy? Well, Q&A or intro? Yeah, I mean, if, if anybody has any questions right off the bat, you can feel free to ask them. Otherwise, these guys have a presentation. Maybe it would be good to just start going through the slides. And if anyone has a question at any point, feel free to ask it in chat or just ask it, just to say, hey, I got a question. It's good, the more, Sounds good. Sounds good to us. Cool. Uh, See your screen. You? Mm -hmm. oh. So good? 
Go. All right. Uh, so I'll, I'll briefly, I'll try to be brief uh, to explain our paper. So I'll start with the retina. So I'm not sure how much you're familiar with the retinal structure. So I'll start with the basic structure first. So if you look at the eye, so this is a human, I assume, I assume, but we're doing it on a mouse retina in this research. But if you look at an eye, this is where the light comes in. And so this is actually your eyeball that's visible to the outside. So when the light comes in this side, it goes directly to the back and it gets reflected and the cones, cones and rods, which are, which are called photoreceptor cells, are the first cell that receives the visual signal. And it passes on to the bipolar cells, which is in the middle between ganglion cells and the photoreceptors. And bipolar cells send a signal to the ganglion cells, and these ganglion cells are the ones that send a signal to the brain. So if you look at it in a planar view, so if you flatten it out, it's kind of like a sandwich kind of structure layer structure. So light comes in this way, it gets to the back, it gets reflected, and photoreceptors receive it, bipolar cells and ganglion cells, and to the brain. So in this research, what we're focusing on is this ganglion cells. And these ganglion cells have their dendrites in this layer, this green layer, which, are, which is called the inner plexiform layer, uh, abbreviated as ITL. And what you have reconstructed is the ICL layer and these ganglion cells. So this is the IWR data set. So this side is basically referring to the layer structure that is shown over here. So thanks to you guys, we were able to reconstruct uh, almost 400 ganglion cells. Alex, I think you should slow down a little bit. Uh, is it too fast? Just let me know if it's too fast. So yeah, so using the, thanks to you guys, you guys have reconstructed for about almost 400 ganglion cells, which are every single ganglion cell in the patch of 350 micrometer by 300 micrometer that has a soma within the patch. And after we skeletonized it, we measured the length, and it, it was 1.524 meters of dendrite, dendrite length. That's crazy. Which is it's very, very long. And that's all during okay. the countdown to Neuropia that happened from 2014 to 2015. Oh, by the way, this is not the final. This is phase three, I, I assume, right? Uh, you mean all the cells there? Yeah, all the cells there. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, which one was phase three? That's only the central patch. Yeah. So it's more than that. That's just the figure from the previous. So on the side, it's not empty. They are they are still uh, cell bodies on the on the side. Oh, even more. Yeah. So after the countdown to Europe, it should be more cells here. But anyway, yeah, that's that's all the ganglion cells we have in the patch of 350 micrometer by 300 micrometer. Right. Uh, I'll just refer to the fact that this is a patch of the retina, just to clarify a little bit. Um, this is just a small section of a retina. It's not the entire retina itself. So it's not like um, we we successfully reconstructed the entire IPL. We've just taken a kind of uh, sector out of the the entire map and then reconstructed the stuff in there. So this may be about what would you say, like a twentieth. Could you say uh, a little louder? Just the last part. So, uh, so yeah, we're just trying to estimate how much of a ret of a full retina this patch would be. Mm. It, I think it's less than a twentieth of a full retina. One, one twentieth. Number wise, there are eighty-five, eight hundred fifty thousand cells. Yeah. And gang uh, cells in the GCL. Yeah. In the what? In the ganglion cell layer? Yeah. Yeah, and I think the number of ganglion cells is like 40% of it, 35 to 40% of 850,000 cells. That, yeah. That so right. that's about, like, let's say 400,000 cells. Yeah. And we have 400, 400 ganglion cells over here. Yeah, 100,000. So that would be, yeah, we, we less, I assume. But that thing, that doesn't seem to, oh, because the, so I was, I was what I was calling to mind was figure one. Or we had like the blow up. But that oh, okay. The hemi retina to begin with. So, 
Yeah. Vincent did an estimate that there were 58,000 uh, ganglion cells in a mouse retina. 58? Yeah. That seems a little under. Under? More than that? That's still the same. That's somewhat close. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of cells. We did about four, 381. I mean, suffice it to say, this is pretty small. Yeah, it's a pretty small subset yeah. of cells. Yeah, so we are just trying to say this is not a whole retina. Right. This is just a sub, a small patch right. on the retina. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, yeah, and also we uh, I said 381 ganglion cells here, but these these are the cells we only took into consideration for the research. But there are about 16 more cells, so it's actually 396 ganglion cells. But we took out the 15 cells because they had some. They didn't look like a complete cell, so we took that out from our analysis. So yes, those are the data sets. So I want to briefly go into like, so why are we studying this ganglion cells in this research? Why not other like, well, other cells are also being studied, but why are ganglion cells important to study? So as I said before, ganglion cells are the only output neurons in the retina, which means they are the only class of cells that connect to the brain. And each type of the ganglion cells are known to confuse distinct visual features, meaning that like certain types have of a ganglion cell have a specific role in computing a visual feature, such as a type could a uh, single type could only be responsible for detecting uh, a stimuli that goes in certain directions, which which are called direction selective cells, or like if you look at the speaker. Like a type of cell could be only responsible for detecting the local motion relative to the global motion, like such as that. So each type has a distinct role. So Does that this kind of leads. Anybody have any questions yes? about those? Uh, about that, the, the stimuli for the ganglion cells. Okay, I just see if there's any questions about that. All right. All right. So, this is kind of important to know the types of ganglion cells because understanding the diversity is a necessity for understanding the retinal circuit. So, that's why in this research, we actually classify the cells we have about 400 ganglion cells into 47 clusters. And if you look at the ganglion cells, uh, <laughs> the major morphological characteristic is that if you look at from the side view, like this figure over here, the retina has a, uh, the ganglion cells have a dendrite in a very planar way. So it's, if you look from the side view, it looks like a straight line from the side. So this is the major characteristic. And different types have a location of this layer in a different position um, in this direction. So this is one of the major features we use to classify 47 clusters. And also, if they have a dendrite in a similar location, if you look at from the upper view now, if you look from the above, so this number corresponds to the location of this dendrite, and these two types have a location of dendrite in a similar position, but if you look at it from the top view, you can obviously notice that this cell is more sparse than this cell. So this kind of morphological feature is taken into account to classify the cells into 47 clusters. And as a result, these are the gallery of 47 clusters. And as our paper suggests, we have found six new types that doesn't have any correspondence to the previous literature. So yeah, this is one of the achievement in the paper. Any questions on types? Uh, do you think that the difference in the general shape of the cell is going to have much difference in difference in how it functions, or is that still to be seen? Uh, definitely, because uh, when I was explaining about this location of the dendrites, uh, that kind of directly approximates uh, which kind of bipolar cell it connects to. So it it suggests the connectivity too. So different 
morphological characteristics definitely would lead to a different functional role of the cell. Yeah, another way of saying pretty much the same thing is that in order for two cells to connect, they have to have their branches in the same spot. And so where they, each of these cell types decide to branch basically limits the kinds of partners that it can have and should determine some of its functional characteristics. That's, a, that's at least the, the, the theory behind what, why we're clustering things this way. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's just hard to know. And I'm sure you guys have thought a lot about this. It's hard to know how much of that comes down to the shape of the cell itself and where it's located, I suppose. So by, so uh, maybe the, the follow there is, what do you mean by shape? So there are, at, at least in the sense of how, what depth you, each of these branches, uh, where, these, where the branches appear, that certainly makes sense in terms of, um, you know, limiting the kinds of partners can, you can have. But yeah, I think you're right. It is, it's not clear as to what kinds of other descriptions of shape might lead to different kinds of partners. Um, but you can, all you can do is kind of qualitatively or qualitatively and quantitatively try to separate things and see if they have differences down the line. Also, I think an example to your question could be, if you read the 2014 iWire paper, that also explains how the morphological characteristic of direction selectivity cells could lead to the mechanism of why the direction selectivity happens. So I think that could be also a good reference to like part of your question, how the morphological characteristics lead to the functional characteristics. Um, by the way, um, on a larger scale, I mean, uh, by size, the size of, each of those cells can, in, can indicate something uh, in the sense that a larger cell will likely be responsible for responding to some large, larger phase features and small cells are likely to um, care for small resolution details in, uh, in the scene. Uh, that's definitely um, what we believe. Uh, <coughs> but to the other, but uh, you may be caring about the shapes in the sense of, uh, yeah, the, the final detail shape, how many branches, how many, um, yeah, how sparse it looks. Mm -hmm. For those, we don't have clear idea uh, why they are like that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, then I guess we can move on. So I'll move on to our digital museum. I, I don't know whether you guys have looked into our online museum or not, but I, I assume you guys did. It's very pretty. It's very pretty. So I want to explain some novelty about the museum itself. So, so museum is kind of like a brain atlas, but traditional brain atlas such as bigbrain.org on the left figure only shows the microscopic regions of the brain. So you're not able to see like single cell within a brain or such as other uh, traditional brain atlas could be neuromorpho.org, which enables you to see only at the single cell. You can only look a morphology of a single cell by a uh, single cell at once. But in our museum, the novelty is that you can view subset of cells which you've selected, and you can also look at the anatomical property on the collapsible sidebar and also the functional property of individual cells at the same time. So Amy wanted me to do a live demo. So I think this would help. So this is our pretty museum. So now we're looking at type 27 of the ganglion cells. So there are four cells in type 27, and you can zoom it in to see the, how the dendrites are located. 
And if you look at from the side view, you can see since it's two seven, it has it is a by stratify cell, so it has dendrites in layer two and layer seven. And if you look from the top view, it looks like this, and it covers the patch entirely. And if you pull up a sidebar on the right, you are able to see the plots for individual cells. Let's move the cells to the left. So blue line corresponds to the stratification profile, which is one of the derived anatomical property of the cell, this blue cell over here. You can show the side piece for that one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So let's see. You can also... And I'll just remove the other cells to show this. So now we only have the blue cell on the screen, and we only have the blue plot on the screen. So if you look at the view, uh, did anybody have a question? Uh, just, oh, I saw somebody ask a question. Uh, so if you look at from the side view, you can see that uh, major dendrites are located in this layer. So this plot is basically plotting the density of dendrites along this axis. So since it has a dendrite in this layer, you can see a clear peak on this layer two, around 0 0.2 of the ICL depth. So this means it has a lot of dendrites in this layer over here. And you can also see a second depth that has a, another set of dendrites in it, which is this peak over here. So this means there are also a lot of dendrites in this layer, which is a, around 0 0.7 of the ICL depth. So this kind of summarizes the anatomical uh, property of this blue cell over here. And if you slide it in the bottom, you can also see the functional property as well of the blue cell. So this graph, which is called the directional response. So for a functional study, we had a light stimuli. So it's kind of like a moving bar stimuli moving in eight different directions. So like this direction, this direction, this direction, this direction, in you know, eight different ways. And this plot summarizes which which direction it responds mostly to. So in this kind of cell, it has a stronger response in this direction than in this direction. And the last uh, graph is called the temporal response. So as I said, we measured in eight different directions and this is kind of the average, uh, average response in all those eight directions. And we did a several trials too, so it's also average over trial as well. So, so that spike is showing that the cell fires when a stimulus is coming from that direction. Yes, right. Actually, it's clear to show you the direction selective cells if you want to look at the functional. So this is a direction selective cell uh, with 37C. So if you look at this direction selective cell, you can uh, in this plot, you can clearly see that it has a larger signal in this side of the graph, which means it's only responding to this direction selectivity. So yeah, this is the purpose of why we're plotting this directional response polar plot. And also for this subset of cells, we can also rotate it around and zoom it in, which is a beauty. So yeah, that's the, basically the novelty of our medium. Anything you guys want to add? Oh, you can browse the list of types. Right. The, yeah. So if you pull up the left collectible sidebar, there are several functions. Uh, you can browse the gallery, which shows the type by type. So you can see 47 clusters summary over here. So this is the top view, and the panel B is the side view. And also, Also, there are like several other functions. I'll move it to dealer. Uh, such as you can take a screenshot. It'll give a screenshot of the subset of cells that appears on the screen. And also you can get the meshes of the data. Or you, if you do copy the URL and just send it to somebody, and that person is basically going to look at the same screen that, that appears on your screen as well. And there are some uh, information about publications or wiki data on the left side as well. So this is pretty much it on the museum. Any questions? I have a quick question. Yes. 
or, or rather a request, would you mind talking briefly about how the directional response was measured for these cells, for the chart? Oh, yeah. Good question. Thank you want to do it? Um, maybe you could speak a little closer to the mic so people can hear you well. Uh, how it's measured. Um, um, well, uh, so um, in brief, uh, uh, Alex already said we have a moving bar that moves in eight directions. Um, so, so we give some stimuli to these cells in the sense that we show these cells a, uh, um, we show these cells uh, some light stimuli or we let the, these cells look at a screen with light bars moving uh, along uh, moving on the screen and the uh, light bar moved in eight different directions and it's, so it's therefore, like zebra stripes right sorry say it again it's like zebra is it zebra stripes or is it a single bar of light single bar it's a single bar so you would have the retina kind of laying flat and then you have a bar going going over the top of it yeah that's right I'll just put the figure one. And that simulates like something moving in an animal field of view in a specific direction. That's right. That's right. So while the bar is moving, then we can also simultaneously record the response from those cells. Um, therefore, we could uh, uh, figure out um, the, the magnitude of the response. Uh, for each direction. That's how we get the eight directions uh, in the polar plot. Um, yeah, is that roughly clear? Uh, or, um, yes, yes, thanks very much. Yeah, so yeah, in, uh, um, I think you may you may be already looking at the screen. So in the panel D there, um, the, the top half of the panel D, that uh, green uh, thing with um, yeah with small light uh, uh, light squares and arrows, that's the eight directions of moving of a moving bar uh, moving. Uh, that's the schematic of that. And this is how the raw functional data looks like. It's, it's a calcium imaging data. And when it uh, fires, the cell, this, these are the somas, and they light up when they fire. And this is summarizing the response of that calcium response. Uh, the dashed lines are also of interest. So the um, below each bar that, that depicted is you know, with an arrow, so it's moving. Um, the bar supposedly enters the, where the cell can see it at the first dashed line, and it leaves it at the second dashed line. So you can usually see that something happens around those dashed lines, whether it's when it enters the field or when it exits the field. Um, th this is also a good chance to orient to um, kind of where the E2198 data. Yeah, the size of the data set. Right. So on the top left, on the top left in panel A, uh, that's what's called a hemi retina, and then that yellow dashed box in the middle is the date is the eye wire data set. That's where everything comes from that has um, been reconstructed for this part of the eye wire project. Did you call it a heavy retina? Hemi retina. Hemi retina. Hemi. Okay. Yeah. So this whole thing is only. Uh, actually, I think it's a quarter. Uh, well, it, uh, is it half or a quarter? I've heard, seen it called a hemi retina a couple times. Uh, okay, yeah, the, this this is half of the retina. Yeah. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, this whole thing is, is half of the retina. And that yellow square is where our IOR data set is. Cool. Um, but then, so pa panel E is also uh, kind of cool. So that's showing just how we get the trace that shows up in the museum. So what you do is you can see that, yeah, that's, that's a good idea, nice. Um, so you, if you take panel D, you see that there are multiple trials where the bar moves in different directions. If you split those uh, bar movements up, then you have you know, eight separate trials of where bars enter or exit the visual field. Then you basically just average over those. And that's what that plus sign means. And on the bottom, you get this average trace and that's what pops up in the eyewire museum. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we're good. <laughs> so I'll move on to like some of the neuroscience findings that we have on our paper. So we have three new findings in our paper. Two of them, which is the structural principle of the IPL, and third one, which relates the structural uh, principle with the functional uh, principle. So I explained the stratification profile before. So it's kind of a density of dendrites on along this axis. So this this kind of cell, for example, has a lot of dendrites in this layer and this layer. So it, it's a bistratified cell. Specifically, this cell you're referring to the dark oh, blue one. The dark blue one over here. And these yellow bar, uh, yellow line and this uh, cyan line refers to where the starburst emocrine cells lie. So it's kind of like a reference point in the IPL. And I'll explain what these lines serve as later or soon. So yeah, I'll go into that later. So first principle is, first finding we have found is we found an objective way, purely anatomical way, to divide layer into four sublamina. So in the previous literature, or traditionally, people have been dividing the IPL, which, which where the ganglion cells dendrites live in, into several sublamina. But they didn't have any like objective way of dividing it. It was rather more subjective. Uh, so in this research, as I explained, ganglion cells have their, have their dendrites in a very planar way. So it's very, it, it, it looks like a line if you fr uh, look from the side view. So if you plot a stratification profile of all uh, 400 ganglion cells we have in our data set, so this is kind of a summary, summary of it, you can clearly see a gap in the middle, like along this, uh, about this place, about this location, and about this location. And in this way, we are able to divide the IPO into four sublamina, so one, two, three, four sublamina, uh, basically, by finding where there are relatively less dendrites in the IPO depth. And what's interesting is, so previously, uh, this division corresponds to where the off cells are and the on cells are. And what do you mean by off and on cells? Oh, uh, by off and on cells, I mean off cells are the cells that respond to the dark stimuli, and on cells are the cells that respond to the light stimuli. So remember that we, uh, tested with a light bar moving into the cell. So when the light bar enters, it's basically turning the light on. So when it responds to the entering uh, signal, it, that's the on cell. And when it responds to the exiting signal, then it's basically turning on to off, right? Since it's becoming dark. So those cells are the off cell. And this division actually corresponds to the division of off cells and on cells. So that's quite interesting. And also the division over here and this time, remember I told you about the layer of starburst emocrine cells? So that has been used as a convenience because starburst emocrine cells are easy to stain and that those locations are easy to find. But it turns out it's not only the convenience, but it's actually something real that could divide this sub, um, ICL into different layers. And as a result, we're able to divide it into four sub amino of ICL. So we call this the arbor segregation principle, which is on the paper. It might be worth just taking an extra second to kind of 
take a higher level view of this. So why is this important? So if you look, if you imagine just a bunch of wires in a layer somewhere, they could have basically no organization at all. Um, at, you know, at first glance, they could just be wires going all over the place and partners just linking up by some other kind of cues or some other kind of means other than where they happen to be at different places in time. But one of the things, if you look at retinas very closely, what you'll see is that different branches basically restrict themselves to, to specific zones, right? So it's not necessarily that things go randomly all over the place. They're usually specific places that seem to be preferred when, when a, a neuron branches out into a certain space. So basically what we're trying to say here is that there are four of these zones and they, they serve to organize the entire kind of layer structure into four separate layers so that each, these, these are like the, uh, these are the kind of zones where any cell is likely to just uh, locate themselves in order to to find specific partners. So you'll find things that that uh, live in the green zone mostly. You'll find things that find in the purple zone and so on. And you'll find things that have a couple combinations of those zones. But that's about it. You should only see uh, connectivity patterns that re like that relate to these zones. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think this is a good point to go over the terminology. And I'm sure you guys had a lot of confusion reading our paper that has like inner, outer, marginal, central. So I think this is a good figure to explain those terminology to help your understanding of the paper. So relative to this center line, we call the center line to here as an inner region. So these two regions are the inner regions. And if it goes further out, so, so this is where the ganglion cell soma, uh, cell bodies are called the ganglion cell layer. And this direction is where it connects to the brain. And this side is what we call the INL. And that's further away from the soma. And from the center line to INL, we call this the outer zone, outer layer. And so this orange and the sky blue or, or blue layer is the outer layer. Is it yeah, so, to the center of the eye, or is it relative to the ganglion cells, the inner and outer? Uh, can you repeat the question? Is it relative to inner being like more towards the center of the eyeball, or is it inner meaning it's it's closer towards the ganglion cells? So it's it's both. So it's closer to the ganglion cells, and it's also to the center of the eyeball. Right. So if you imagine that it's a whole sphere, then and this is the first layer you see. The deeper you go in that layer, the further out in the sphere you go. So if you kept going past the inner nuclear layer, you'd get to the immigrant, immigrant cell bodies, and you keep eventually going, you get to photoreceptors, and then eventually you get to the outside edge of the eyeball. Right. right. So, yeah. So, immigrant cell cell bodies and photoreceptors would be somewhere on the top. That's right. And so that's relative to the center line, and relative to the uh, middle uh, like quarter lines we call the inside as a central region so this orange and purple region would be central region and outside of this quarter lines would be the marginal region so that kind of gives us the name so this blue region would be called since it's outer and marginal so that's the outer marginal region and this red region would be called since it's outer and central so it's going to be outer central region and this purple would be inner and central so inner central and the green would be inner and marginal so it's going to be inner marginal so that's where all those terminology came from and i hope yeah this is very confusing at the uh, this is very confusing and even us when we were doing the research in the middle we we, we were like puzzled like every time when we call it it's hard to keep it straight right so yeah that's the terminology so if anybody doesn't have a question I'll move on to the next finding. Then I'll move on. So the next finding we have found is what we call the density conservation principle in the paper. So what the density conservation principle says is that, so before that, like traditionally, I'll tell you about what people believe. So if it belongs, if the cells belong to a same type, 
it has been traditionally known to follow a, what we call the tiling principle. So if you have a, uh, like a region that surrounds the dendrite territory, and if you, if you plot that, like the graph over here, the tiling principle says that Ganga cells should cover the entire retina by having as less overlap as possible. So ideally, if it, had, if it covers the retina without any overlap, it's gonna be, so this, num so this number refers to the how much overlap the region has. So this yellow means there are five cells overlapping in this region. So ideally, if it follows the tiling principle, it should be all blue, which, which means every point is covered by only one cell. But obviously, as you can see in this data set, there are lots of regions that have like many coverages. And this has also been uh, reported in previous literature too, saying that the average coverage of its retinal point is about two to three. So this doesn't follow the tiling principle. So we actually took a further step into it. And since we have dense a reconstruction of all the dendrites, we are, we are able to look at the, how much dendrites is in, uh, within its region. So if you zoom it into this red square over here, so let's look at this region. So this region is only covered by a single cell, this yellow cell. So it's it has a coverage of one, but it has a density of 0 0.05. So density is like the amount of dendrites within this region. And if you look at the second region, it has a coverage of two, and it has a density of 0 0.04, which is about the similar range. So even if the two cells are overlapping, it still has a similar density, similar amount of dendrites. Can I just ask a question really quick? The density is of a specific cell type. Uh, yeah, so, so I, I'm only plotting the cells within a specific cell type, and density is the older dendrites of the cells within the same type in, in the region. Okay, thank you. And if you look at this region right next to it, now this region is covered by three cells, the red cell, yellow cell, and purple cell. But even if its coverage is three, the density, the amount of dendrites located in this region is still similar to the other range. So this also, if you look at this region next to it, it's also the same situation. It, it has a coverage of three. So it's covered by green cell, yellow cell, and red cell, but still the amount of dendrites uh, per region is still the same. So what this is suggesting is that regardless of how much overlap there is, every retinal point has a similar amount of dendrites in it. So this is what we call a density conservation principle, and this is kind of the internal validation method to validate the clusters, whether it can be a type or not. So if it passed this test, it can be a type, but if it doesn't pass the test, we, we can't assure that it is a type. Any questions on this? It might be worth noting where thoughts like this came from. Oh, sure. So the idea for why, um, People have observed that cells kind of obey this property that that um, have similar response properties. But if you think about the the retina as a sensor, right? You'd have um, you'd want your so the ganglion cells will be basically trying to sense this particular kind of thing in the visual field somewhere. So it'll have some location and some something it's trying to compute or something it's trying to look for. Um, if you have another cell of the same type, so it's trying to find the same thing, it doesn't really make sense to have two cells in the same location trying to find the same thing. That's kind of inefficient. So the idea is that you'd have two, you have different cells that compute the same thing in different locations everywhere. So they should have separate domains over which they compute this thing that they're looking for. So that's the idea that, um, so the basic idea behind overlap is that they shouldn't really be much overlap between two things that are trying to compute the same thing or trying to look for the same thing. Right. So biologically, it's ineffective if it, if it has a two cells right. in the same region. Kind of a way. Right. Okay. Any questions? Then I'll move on to the, our last finding. So our last finding actually uses the functional data we have. So we, we are relating the structural data with the functional data this time. So you've seen this figure in the arbor segregation principle. So I I'm, think you are now more familiar with it now. So traditionally what has been said is the marginal cells, which has dendrites in the marginal region. So reminder, marginal region is this blue 
and green region on the outside of this quarter line. So those cells tend to have a slower response. So we, what we call the sustained response in the paper. So sustained response basically means that when the stimuli is given, it responds slowly. So it falls slowly. So if you look at this green line over here, you can see that it, uh, it drops more slowly than this purple and orange line over here. So that's, that's what we call the uh, sustained response and slower response. So traditionally, the marginal cells were known to have a slower response. But in our research, what we have found is that that's not actually true. But instead, it's only the inner marginal cells, which are the cells in this green region. So inner and marginal, so this green region. So these green cells are the only ones that have a significantly, uh, statistically significant slow response relative to the other cells. And this finding is interesting because, so we're looking at ganglion cells in this research, but last year in 2017, there was a study on bipolar cells that actually showed a similar result of this. So bipolar cells that have, that, uh, have their connections in this region tends to have, are the only ones that have a statistically significant uh, slow response. So this, those two results kind of correspond. So that's why this finding could be interesting. So any questions on this? Do you know why? Do we know why? Well, if the bipolar cells that innervate the green cells are slower, then it makes sense that the response for the green cells themselves are, is also slower. Oh, was that the question? Or are you saying that do we know why marginal cells, I mean, inner marginal cells are the only ones that have a slow response? That's what I was asking is why are these guys slower than the others? So like mechanism wise, do you know any, do you have any hypothesis? Do you know any hypothesis? Uh, the short question is no, we don't know. Yeah. Um, the long question, what, what Nick will have been saying is because the, these ganglion cells receive input, uh, re receive input from the bipolar cells, and uh, it's uh, relatively better known for the bipolar cells how fast they respond. Um, and uh, the bipolar cells, they look like the, um, yeah, they are slower in that region. That's why these ganglion cells are slower too in that region. Yep, that's pretty much it. Okay. I think Ryan has a question maybe. He unmuted the mic. Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> we did have some general questions in the forum from uh, Susie and also from TR77. Yes, okay. I, I looked into those questions and it was pretty tough. <laughs> <laughs> we can just up. first and see if uh, he's in here. So I'll, I'll pull up the forum, just a second. So, wait, Amy, is this you? Yeah, <laughs> I'll just get any questions started. <laughs> okay. uh, how many kinds of ganglion cells are there? Uh, how, and how many types of cells are we mapping now? So to answer Amy's question. <laughs> Uh, from our data set, uh, we have 30 street types that, has, that, 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 that includes all the securely known types, meaning that it has been validated in a functional way, genetic way, and anatomical way. And also there are, uh, I think, 12 of them that has previous correspondence with literature that has been validated in a functional way or solely genetic way. So it hasn't been validated in both, uh, like all three ways, but only one, one, uh, only two out of three. And we include uh, additional. We have six new types that doesn't have any correspondence to the previous literature, and I think that sums up to 33 types. But we do, we did find 47 clusters, so that kind of implies that there should be about 40 to 50 types of ganglion cells. 
but we couldn't validate uh, we couldn't have validated the other types uh, other clusters into types because there are some limitation of our data of uh, it's, a, it's only a small patch of retina, so for some of the clusters, we only have few cells, so it was hard to validate it as a type. So, yeah, so if we could have a larger patch, it, it might, we would be able to validate more of those clusters into types. So I would say this uh, result suggests that there are about 40 to 50, type, uh, 50 types of ganglion cells in the retina. And going to the next question. I read the paper over read towards the end. <laughs> Just wonder what scientists think about bistratification. Uh, is there a known functional difference between mono and bistratified ganglion cells? And are the two layers synapsing with different cell types in each layer? 81i and 27, 27 stratified in similar two planes, have they, uh, do they have similar functions? No on off, as I understand from figure 4a. Difference is because volume and stratification layer is opposite. So I think Shang, since you did the connectivity analysis, you would have a better answer on this. Uh, oh, sure. Um, so the first question is there a known functional difference between mono and white stratified uh, ganglion cells? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, so the. Oh, wait. <laughs> uh, So uh, for the bi-stratified uh, cells, quite often they stratify both in the um, inner region and also in the outer region. Uh, therefore, uh, if you remember, we have talked earlier, inner region is more um, on response and outer region is off response. Therefore, if it's bi-stratified, it's very likely it's, it's a on-off cell, meaning it, it responds um, and both when the light turns on and when the light goes off. And for monostratified ganglion cells, then they usually only respond when the light comes on or only respond when the light goes off. That's one obvious difference. Um, other than that, uh, well, um, well, I don't have to hear answers beyond that, but that's the major difference here. Okay, um, next question. Um, uh, do these synapse with different cell types in each layer? Yes, they do. Um, it's not just these ganglion cells we are studying that stratify. Um, the bipolar cells, um, remember those are the inputs to these ganglion cells. Um, bipolar cells, different bipolar cell types, they stratify at different depths. So um, the two layers different, then they are um, basically meaning they would be receiving input from different sets of um, bipolar cells. So that's this question. Um, next one, 81i and 27. Um, this one I don't remember. I don't remember uh, off my head, and uh, um, because our stem stimuli is actually pretty um, limited, uh, other people, uh, other researchers, they use all kinds of different stimuli to look at those cells. But in our case here, we only have a removing bar stimuli, so our our stimuli is very limited. So we can't really see how similar or how different the, the uh, response are. Um, so this question, um, it basically, uh, I'm saying this question needs further study. Um, no on off figure for a, uh, which one was mm -hmm. that? Do you guys remember? I, I think uh, we can uh, check. Oh, I think she's saying that 81i and 27 both have on-off response. So I think she's assuming since they both have on-off response, it doesn't mean they have similar functions. I think that's what she's referring to. But, but yeah, so what John was saying a second ago was that we're not exact, we can't say that this stimulus is 
comprehensive in terms of measuring everything these cells might do. So it's entirely possible that those two types, 81I and 27, do have different functional jobs in some sense, but they might just respond in a similar way to similar stimuli in some cases. Yep. Yep. Difference just because volume is verification that you're talking about. Uh, yeah, I mean, to elaborate on this, it, it looks in a similar range, but this minor difference in the depth. So if you look at 81i, it has a outer peak right, relatively in the outer side of it. So this small difference could also serve a quite different fun uh, connectivity mm -hmm. analysis. So yeah, that's, that's also one of the differences that it has. So this is 2.7 and this is 81i. And if you look at the peak, it's quite different. It's located in quite different IPO depth. And I think this illustrates a good use of our museum. So if you have this kind of question, you can go into a museum and look at the plot, and you can obviously see the differences. So I think we can go any further questions, or we can go to TR77's uh, question. Uh, and I think this was a good question. Hmm? I sort of had a follow-up question on um, something that was asked a moment ago. <clears throat> All right. Uh, you said there were like 40 something different clusters and you could yes. only find, or you could only definitively classify six as their own types. Uh, would that sort of suggest that we might be um, going back to an expanded data set to look at more things in that initial layer or? Uh, that might be so a question more directed at Amy than anything else. I don't know how much you guys uh have input over what goes on in as far as what we're scanning in the game oh in the eyewear you mean yeah so the eyewear data set so this e2198 uh data set only has a limited part and we are mapping the entire Im uh, image right now so in order to uh expand the region uh, of mapping we actually need uh, new images and that's not imported in iWire right now. And because it's not collected. Right, yet. right. It's not collected yet. Yeah. Uh, but we do have a postdoc imaging a new retina data set uh, in a larger scale than E2198. So if that comes in, yeah, that's true. We, we would be able to see more clusters being validated, validated as types. But yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, that's the case. So currently in the iWire, we don't have larger sets of images. But yeah, that is the direction that we're going in. There you go. All right, thank you. That was mostly what I wanted to know. All right. So next question is still yours, I think. <laughs> uh, you want to elaborate or should I read the text uh, question on the forum? TR77? I think that was Ryan talking. Oh, no, that was Ryan. Uh, I'm yeah. TR77. Oh, OK. Oh, sorry. My bad. No problem. Uh, yeah, do you want to elaborate? Oh, uh, about my question? Yeah, your question was interesting. Oh, OK, yeah. I, I came across that a while back, and I thought it was interesting, too, uh, because I, I immediately thought, hey, we may be able to see this in iWire uh, if, they, if, they, if these displaced cells show up in the E2198 data set. So, I've been wanting to ask uh, about this for a while, so I thought I'd go ahead and throw it in right now. So, do we have SOMA in INO in our E2198 data set? Uh, we actually, wait, the INL, no, he, he was talking about IPL, inside uh, IPL. Uh, oh, you mean? I think he's talking about INO. Uh, so, so this displaced, uh, displaced ganglion cells, I, I've read few literatures, but it was a really old one, so I don't know how true that is, but might have a ganglion cell soma in the INL instead of yeah. GCL. But I, well, what I was questioning is in E2198, are we able to see the complete soma in the INL? I think it's similar to the amount we have 
the GCL. Oh, really? It's, they're cut off in some places. But. So uh, when we segment the cells in the 2198, and how we, how we know whether it's a ganglion cell, type, a ganglion cell or not is by looking at the axons. Remember, the ganglion cells are the only cells that connect to the brain. So if the stoma have an axon coming out to the brain, that's how we know whether it's a ganglion cell or not. So I was questioning about this, like whether we have the complete stoma in the INO, because in order to know that's a ganglion cell or not, we, we would be able to see the axons coming out. But I'm not sure if 21, like we are able to see the axons coming out for the cell body that's in INO. Yeah, it's really hard to know because you'd have to basically trace the entire cell to know whether or not it is truly a displaced ganglion cell or just an endocrine cell or something. Right. So, yeah, in essence, it's hard to know whether we'd see them, but there should be some right there. It's just hard to know which ones would be which. I see where you're going with this. Is there, would there be any way to tell the difference uh, based on the, the dendritic arbor itself uh, without being able to see the axon? Or would we really have to be able to see the axon coming off of it to distinguish between the two? It, I think that's possible, we just don't know. So a lot of the work we've done just now is basically trying to figure out how well we can distinguish cell types based on dendritic arbors at all. So it's possible that that's, that's doable, but we don't know for sure yet. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, great, thanks. That's a good question. Um, and I can comment a little bit on the RNL, uh, no, the, the IPL part. Uh, I have seen uh, a few, uh, I guess not a few, uh, between maybe one to three somas within the IPL too. Um, but I don't believe we have reconstructed those. Mm -hmm. um, Are you talking about in the E2198 data set? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, yes, the raw uh, 3D image. I I believe I have seen uh, a few uh, cell bodies in the iron in the IPL, um, but I'm not sure if they are ganglion cells or what kind of cells they are. Okay, thanks very much for uh, addressing this. I, like I said, I came across it a while back, and I just found the idea intriguing because I, I thought, wow, we we could maybe see this in the eye wire, so. Yeah, that's true, that's like, definitely true. Glad mm -hmm. we could get to it. Any other questions below? Uh, that was pretty much it. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I have been keeping an eye on eye wire chat and I haven't seen any other questions there either. Okay. So, yeah, any other questions? Or any other comments? Any favorite things from the paper? You know, there, are there other things that people would like to know about either this data set or the retina in general? It might be good to, you know, have some outside input in terms of even where to guide the research in some sense. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, last. Oh, yep. Shoot it. No, I was just saying that I'm good. Right. Okay. Uh, actually, I have a, I mean, suggestion for Amy. Uh, mm. uh, Amy, can you tell more about like where iWire is heading and what kind of future task iWire would be suggesting? Or you can briefly introduce Neo. Oh yeah, sure. So I think. I, do all of you guys who are here, you guys have heard about Neo for sure, right? Yes. 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 I'm in the beta. Yeah. So we, uh, all the new features that we're building for iWire are intended to work not just in iWire, but to also be applicable to this new game that we've sort of been working on called Neo. And I say we lightly because it's really um, our collaborators who've been gathering data and the guys at Princeton who have been um, who have been building the backend neuroplancer that will become Neo? 
Um, we, in the very short term, we will be, you guys are the first to know this, but we're going to be doing beta testing for notifications, a notification system in iWire starting on Monday. So that hasn't even been sent out yet, but you guys are all, of course, invited to help us uh, beta test that. Uh, and I think that's going to be kind of a new chapter for more personalized iWire experience, as well as giving players more um, more personal feedback. And our illustration and we have an animation intern starting on Friday. <laughs> so this summer we'll be doing a lot of game design and hopefully some front-end UI uh, game development as well on what will eventually become Neo. And the players in iWire are going to be the first ones invited for uh, to, to do beta testing or really alpha, I guess, pre-alpha testing of Neo. Uh, and as it's, it's been mentioned before, but uh, and Nick can probably go into more detail, but Neo comes from Cortex, it's from primary visual cortex. So the axons of these ganglion cells form the optic nerve, which goes down into the thalamus, and then it goes from the thalamus, like it's related a couple times in there, something like that, and then it goes into visual cortex, where it percolates, where they form uh, synapses with lots of different cells, some of which we will be mapping in Neo. And the rough estimate, as far as I know, is about 100,000 neurons, maybe 80,000 neurons, and about 1 billion synapses between those neurons. So iWire is 350 by 300, or 360 by 300 by 60 microns, uh, and this data set for Neo will be one cubic millimeter, so much, much larger by volume than iWire. Nick, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that. And much higher resolution images than... Oh, yeah, that's true. It's like 10 times higher res, isn't it? iWire is 16 pixels. This is like four, three? Yeah, uh, yep. Um, one thing that's the big difference between iWire and the other, any other data that you'll see on it, probably you'll see it in whatever's in the beta now, is that the insides of cells are stained this time. So you'll be able to see. Get the video back. Hold on just one second. I'm trying to get the video back to you guys, but it's stuck. It's stuck on my face. Hold on. Oh, should I stop sharing my screen? Yeah, 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 screen? Good. yeah, then I can show you guys. That's probably why. Otherwise, it's just going to be me here. Yep, I stopped sharing my screen. <laughs> there we go. All right, cool. Uh, one big difference is that uh, the insides of the cells will, will now be stained. So you'll see lots of the intracellular machinery that um, underlies a lot of the things that neurons do. You'll see mitochondria, you'll see vesicle clouds, you'll see postsynaptic stuff. Um, that'll be cool. Um, I'm not sure what else to add. It looks really cool because the mitochondria, I mean, even the thing from lab meeting the other day, the mitochondria are like these spaghetti noodles that are going all down the dinner. Uh, it's very long. <laughs> <laughs> As with a lot of it, you know, just seeing it for the first time is really weird because you just, the textbook images that you see of neurons just don't really do it justice a lot of the time. Right. This explains why the cells were so empty. I, I just had never thought that that would be the reason why. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the one part of this, the E2198 data says they actually went, they actively tried to remove the staining from the insides of cells. The idea was that it might make it easier to trace either by human or machine. Um, but that w later data sets just don't do that basically. So you'll see more stuff for sure. Yeah. And Atani, I think we answered your question, but I wear a 16 point something nanometer per pixel and Neo. Yeah, is it's a little four nano, so it's like three point eight by like more almost four nano by four nano uh, three point five of wait neo means phase two or neo means I think the image yeah right. so we think it might be even but it's hard to say because we right. haven't gotten the images so really so yet. it's about four nanometer by four yeah. nanometer by forty yeah, yeah that's right. and I wear it was sixteen point five by sixteen point five by twenty three yeah and that's for each pixel yeah for each so 10 times higher resolution. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, I think this is also good to know. So for the iWire data set or for our research, uh, one of the biggest limitation we had was that since like everything's gone inside the cell, we are not able to identify any of the synapses. 
So basically, like context doesn't mean that it has a synaptic connection in it. So that was one of the limitations that our research had. I just wanted to let you guys also know about that. So in the future projects, since we have, we can also able to see the synaptic vesicles in the cells, in the EM images. So we would be able to know where the synaptic locations are, are, which is very important for studying the connectivity. Oh, so Tani was also asking if, I don't know what the resolution is. I don't remember for zebrafish. Yeah, so that's 5545. Five, so similar, but a little higher. Okay. So five, five nanometers per pixel on the mystic. Cool. Well, I guess if there are no other questions, I guess we should wrap this up. Yeah, uh, so we were doing a lot of press interviews recently, and me many people are curious what's next for the eyewires <laughs> than what's next for us. So, <laughs> yeah, we skipped it up. Uh, you guys are doing a great part of our Absolutely. So, yeah, for science, yeah. Yeah, for science. <laughs> for science. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you guys for joining this Hangout. Uh, we'll, maybe we'll do more of these uh, in more regular fashion in the future. Or if you guys want, we can also do Q&A kind of things in iWire chat and get them transcribed into blog posts to just keep you guys updated on this journey towards the new data set, Neo, and also just to keep you guys updated with all the things that are going on in the lab, because there's a lot of stuff <laughs> between Highwire and Zebrafish and this big IRPA project, and there may even be other things that I don't even know about. Um, it's just really exciting because everything is so new and big and bold, and it's, and it's a great honor to be a part of it with all of you guys from all over the world. So we thank you so much for being a part of the iWire community. This would not be possible without you <laughs> and that you guys have played for so long and with such dedication. Um, we see you and we appreciate you. So I guess I'll end the recording and end the hangout and we'll get this uploaded on YouTube and I'll see you guys on iWire chat. Great. Thanks guys. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.